Welcome to In The Reels. So happy to have you. My name is Jamie Bruce. We've got a lot to cover, including a conversation about director Kelly Reichardt, followed by CK and CK at the movies. But for now, let's jump right into our first segment, Features. This week, the toy company Mattel announced they're beginning a production on an Uno movie. Clearly, they're trying to capture the successes of other board game themed movies such as Battleship, Ouija, and Jumanji. Robbie Brenner of Mattel, the executive producer on the project, was quoted as saying, Uno is a game that transcends generations and cultures, and we look forward to partnering with Lil Yachty, as well as Coach P and Brian Sher to transform the classic Uno game into a comedic action adventure. That's right. Lil Yachty is going to be producing the movie. And you know, it's probably a bad omen if the career rapper wants to sign on to a project about a game where the best move you can make is, I'm about to ruin this whole man's career. The real question is, why is a toy company producing movies? Diversify your portfolio can be good for a college student, but not so much for a multi-billion dollar brand. This is like if Amazon just got bored of selling stuff online and made actual stores. Oh, wait. What is it with all these companies branching out into new arenas? Do they not already make a stupid amount of money? Take GameStop. You all probably know something about the situation with GameStop and their stocks. But in a not so shocking turn of events, producers and film companies have already proposed four movies or shows about the whole story. You can tell something went catastrophically wrong when one group of wealthy people are trying to profit off another group of wealthy people. Usually we just see that top down, like increasing prices on products or I don't know. Not taking my brand new game for anything more than $12, GameStop. There's all sorts of ways the pandemic has affected the film industry. And with more on that, let's bring on Features senior film correspondent, Bruce Junio, live at our local theater with an update on the situation. Bruce. How are ticket sales going? Well, you see, about that one, um, there, there aren't any because, you know, the theaters aren't even open. So you decided to send me out here on the coldest day of the year for absolutely nothing. Sounds like a typical Jamie move. Mm, well, see if you can get a quick interview or something. We'll get right back to you in a second. Okay, well, moving on. The Golden Globes were this past weekend and it saw a bunch of stars virtually instead of in person. There were dresses, awkward moments, a touching tribute to Chadwick Boseman, and John Boyega in sweatpants for some reason. The event was hosted by Amy Poehler and Tina Fey and was split between Fey in New York and Poehler in Los Angeles. The last time the duo hosted in 2015, Poehler claimed it would be their final time and much like most of us this last year, they found themselves doing the exact thing over and over again. But this time, there's a two second delay. Faye and Poehler made a handful of jokes in their opening monologue, one of which was a very pointed comment about the issue of diversity. Uh, the Golden Globes are awards given out by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association is made up of around 90 international no black journalists who <laughs> attend movie junkets each year in search of a better life. <laughs> we say they got paid to make that joke. The whole show was under the shadow of a recent New York Times report that said the Hollywood Foreign Press Association has zero black members. To their credit, the organization acknowledged that issue with a heartfelt statement about the need for diversity in their ranks during the broadcast. The truth that's not often discussed is that awards play a part in the economic reality of black filmmakers, artists of color, and women creators in this business which is a heartfelt statement coming from the same award show that did this to actor Daniel Kaluuya, accepting the Best Supporting Actor Award earlier in the show. <laughs> As you can see, we unfortunately have a bad connection. There's nothing more poetic than an all-white organization discussing the merits of black inclusion less than an hour after literally silencing one of the most popular black actors in the world. In addition, Chloe Zhao won Best Director for the film Nomadland, becoming the only the second woman to ever win the award. The first woman to win was Barbara Streisand in 1983 for Yentl, where 
and I'm not kidding here, the story is of a woman having to disguise herself as a man in order to get into an all-man's organization. That just sounds about right. Even with the show being mostly virtual, where stars effectively just stared at a camera in their home offices, they all still dressed to the nines. Well, except at, everyone except Jason S Sudeikis. The actor accepted his award for Best Actor in a Comedy Series for his role in Ted Lasso, rocking a neon green and blue tie-dye hoodie. You can read all about it in his new book, Things a Woman Couldn't Get Away With. The pandemic has really changed how everything is done in the film industry. Being mostly virtual isn't too fun, but to be fair, were the Golden Globes ever fun? This is the event that Ricky Gervais has hosted five times? Did anyone really think that the guy who favors the UK version of The Office would do a good job at entertaining? <laughs> Listen. It's clear that the award show needs a makeover, and frankly, this could have been the year to do it. The pandemic has affected how everything happens, and no one would even bat an eye if they took a better approach to the show than recycling hosts because they're comfortable or leaving talent to comment on the biggest story in the industry. If the Hollywood Foreign Press Association really meant it when they said that black inclusion is vital, then it shouldn't have taken a bombshell report from the New York Times to make a serious change. Every year, black-led projects are blindsided for the same few white actors or directors, and it's so legitimately disappointing. Even the Academy Awards often take forever to adapt to the times. Just last year, Bong Joon-ho's Parasite became the first non-English speaking film to win Best Picture in the nearly 100 years since they first gave out that award. The drive for diversity is about momentum, and the more changes you make for the better, the more will follow. And you can always start by, I don't know, not having every single member of your organization be somewhere between mayo and alabaster. We'll be right back. Before we throw it to Harrison Swales with a different direction, let's check in one more time with our own Bruce Juno outside the theater. Bruce, did you find someone to talk to? Were they maybe just a little less grumpy than you? Uh, yeah. This this right here is. Who are you? Ayush. Th this is Ayush. Um. Why are you at the mall? And it's I take it it's not for the movies. Do you watch movies? I I do watch movies, but that's not why what I'm here for. Yeah, because are the movies even open? Did you fall on your head? There's a pandemic going on. Movies are not open. Theaters are not open. So, okay. Do you know why I'm here? Absolutely not. Yeah, me neither. I'm gonna go to that food court. Do you know how good it is? <laughs> yeah, it's shit. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, well. Can I go? Yeah, go. Get out of here. Leave right now. In fact, yeah. J Jimmy. <sighs> well, thanks for absolutely nothing, Bruce. Bruce Juno, everyone. I guess I'm never going to him again. And that's all the time we have for features here tonight. Later, stick around for CK and CK at the movies, but right now, here's a different direction. As mainstream movies have grown bigger and more expensive, Kelly Reichardt's films take a throwback to simpler times. And in fact, a few of her films are period pieces, but each story is relevant to our modern day lives. She's garnered worldwide awards for a quiet, methodical filmmaking. My name is Harrison Swales. Let's stop, take a break, smell the roses, and go in a different direction with Kelly Reichardt. Kelly Reichert was born in Miami Dade County, Florida in 1964. While Miami may be the third most populated metropolis on the East Coast, there is far more to this location. It is the home to the Everglade National Park. Through Reichert, though Reichert has not openly discussed her childhood, her lush green imagery and bright outlook of the region shows she has spent time exploring her surroundings of her home. 
Her debut film, River Grass, shot in her hometown. It's a bare-bones dramatic crime story about a woman's liberation. It was a critical hit and it was nominated for the Sundance Grand Jury Prize after its premiering screening. However, this first feature was not her first credit on the film. Three years earlier, in 1991, she worked on Todd Haynes' Poison. As a costume and prop designer, Haynes is a vital part of Reichardt's career. He was the person that encouraged her to move to Oregon. The Beaver State would provide the backdrop and inspiration for almost all of her films to come. This transition to the West Coast starts off with a very special film called Old Joy. The story focuses on a pair of estranged friends. Daniel London plays Mark, just married with her one child on the way. Will Oldman plays Kurt, a drifter and a stoner who has yet to grow out of his 20s. Kurt reaches out to Mark in hopes of taking a weekend hiking trip. The film charts their escape into the Cascade Mountains. They don't get lost, no bear attacks them. It's a total character piece. The film's a study of friendship. How does Mark react to Kurt showing up out of nowhere? How awkward can that reunion feel? We have a clip here from Old Joy to show the first car ride together. How's your dad? All right, you know, all things considered. Last I heard he was living in a new place. Yeah, right. Yeah. For some reason he decided at age 70 that he didn't want to be married anymore, so he moved out. Yeah, that's what I heard. Then he ended up with these blood clots on his brain. And they just showed up out of nowhere. He was really weak for a while, nobody knew what to do. Then they dissolved, just went away. <laughs> That's heavy. Really uh, put my mom through the ringer. Yeah, I bet. I bet. It's kind of like when an old Eskimo goes off to die alone. Who knows? <laughs> you still have this. Isn't this used to be Noah's? Yeah. Found it behind Kruger's. There's... As we started to see at the tail end of that scene, the buildings are replaced by the forest background. Through those background details, the scenery is changing. In a traditional film, we would see a wide shot of the forest to really make sure we knew where we are. But here, Reichardt wants us to focus on their relationship. It feels awkward. They aren't even talking about each other. The focus is on the conversation as a character that we never even see. I think we all have had those moments in life where nobody knows what to really say. Like when you are first thrown into a breakout room during a Zoom class. Talk about the weather, sports, or anything else. The blocking for this clip is also important. If you could pull up the clip again, it shows the internal unspoken friendship in a physical way. The discussion is one-sided, so Riker has the camera peeking in through the window. Kurt is closer to the camera. As a result, he looms over Mark, who's essentially in the background of the shot. Kurt asks Mark about his father in an attempt to open up about his family. After all, Mark is about to have a kid of his own. Paternal anxiety is a strong theme throughout this film. This backpack trip might as well be their bachelor party, the last chance of freedom before he gives up these kinds of weekends to focus on his new family. Let's jump ahead to the tail end of the clip and look at the edit. An, an important concept of editing is motivation. When you cut to the next shot, it should be motivated by something, an emotion, an action, or a line of dialogue. Mark taking out the bottle could lead to an insert shot, a close-up of the bottle to get a better look. However, this cut here reveals something else, a smile. Kurt has gotten Mark to open up a touch. Of course, they grow closer together as the story progresses. Better Journey is better experience than talked about. Upon release, they went on to win awards at the Rotterdam International Film Festival and the Sarasota Film Festival. It is basically the genesis of Kelly Reichert's career and brought her into contact with author Jonathan Raymond. His short story of the same name inspired Old Joy. These two would go on to co-write almost all of Reichardt's features, except for Certain Women and River Grass. Reichardt and Raymond's collaboration comes to an incredible peak of 2020's first cow. Working with current indie studio superstar, A24, Riker would make her longest film to date that would also have the biggest box office opening of her career. First Cow takes place in the same region as Old Joy, just 200 years in the past. As the pioneer era West, we come across Cookie, played by the Umbrella Academy's John Magaro. He's a soft-spoken gatherer who has a rare talent for baking pastries, which given the time period is so precious. After forming a bond with King Lou, played by Orion Lee, the two decide to go into business with one another. They need milk for their oily cakes, so they turn to their titular animal. The cow was owned by a wealthy English man known as Chief Factor, played by Toby Jones. Flank fee for Cookie and King Lou, there's no thing as security at night, and the business starts to flourish. It's the getting started that's the puzzle. No way for a poor man to start. You have a cow. First cow in the territory. 
This ain't a place for cows. Well, it's no place for white men either. I sense opportunity here. We essentially see the birth of capitalism in North America. Their supply and demand and scarcity being applied to their business as they are only per people around that can bake sweets like these. Before Cookie decides to start baking, he admits to King Lou, I'm tired of this water and flour bread, to which Lou replies, a matter of fact way, so is everyone. At one iconic moment, Chief Factor tastes the oily cake and made, his, made of his own stolen milk and lovingly states, I taste London in this cake. Making a film in the Wild West while devoiding so much energy to ideas of economic subverts, what an audience expects in a, in a Western. For the most part, the Western genre consists of a vigilante or a man with no name that comes into a town to save the helpless villagers. Here, Reichardt is ignoring the hyper-masculine canon with a film about economics and friendship. Every time a fight breaks out, it happens in the background. One such scene is blocked in a way that Cookie walks past the fight because he is too exhausted to be bothered with it. The friendship between Cookie and King Lou is in a way an echo of Mark and Kurt and Old Joy, the introvert and the extrovert. These two films, Old Joy and The First Cab, provide a perfect double feature if you want to start watching the films of Kelly Reichardt. They are beautiful meditative works that focus on the power of nature and nurture. Her filmmaking provides a great different direction for the filmgoer who wants, per who wants peace in the films they watch. Hello and welcome to our very first episode of CK and CK at the Movies. I'm your host, Cameron Kircher, and today I am joined by an incredible guest, the wonderfully, wickedly talented Cole Kajajian. Cole, thanks for being here. Now, first thing we gotta do is uh, talk about this wacky getup you're wearing. What, what is up with that? It's called a suit. You might wanna- do But why, why are you wearing it? Well, I figured we were gonna be doing like this big like, Academy Awards show. We're gonna be talking about all like the nominations what? for, you know? Well, Golden Globes were last week. Did you just think, that I said the Academy Awards show. Yeah, that's like in a couple months. Right, I thought we were doing this like preliminary. Like, no, 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 no. That, that, that's a couple episodes down the line. <laughs> I, don't know why, I don't know why you would think that. I think that's kind of embarrassing to be honest. Um, okay. Uh, so Cole, how was your break? You have a, you have a nice... Uh... I'm sorry, but you, you had to, you know, say crap about mine, and I, I don't know what the farm boy, you know, look okay, is going well, on here, so I'm just gonna, just gonna, here you go. Just, oh, wow, thank, thanks, Cole, bit. for a clip-on tie. This must have cost you a pretty penny. Um, Cole, how was your break? Um, my break was pretty good. I, I got to watch a lot of movies with oh. my time off. Uh, from Devil All the Time uh, mm. with uh, Tom Holland uh, and Bill Skarsgård to Spider Man. I'm of ending of things. Yes, uh, he's been having a very big variety of you know movies in his filmography mm -hmm. ever since he got that role. You know, his first movie, The Impossible. Uncharted. Yes, The Uncharted he's is going to be Uncharted. Um, stop cutting me off, please. Yeah. Um, in any case, uh, Uncharted is gonna be coming up. I'm not sure how I feel about that because you know, mm. video game movies don't always do very well. Assassin's Creed wasn't very highly rated mm -hmm. with uh, Michael Fassbender. Uh -huh. um, I'm thinking of Ending Things was another good movie uh, oh. that I watched. Okay. Uh, and it's all about, I think, you know, really internal struggle mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. um, but today, I wanted to talk specifically about Judas okay. and the Black Just, Messiah. No. No? Our first movie today is Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, the story is uh, Bill O'Neill infiltrates the Black Panther Party per FBI agent Mitchell and J. Edgar Hoover as party chairman Fred Hampton ascends, falling for a fellow revolutionary en route, a battle wages for O'Neill's soul. What did you think of Judas and the Black Messiah? I think battle waging for O'Neill's soul is a perfect way to kind of sum up what this movie is all about. Mm -hmm. Because you have, you know, a criminal uh, who's given a second opportunity to really bring his life back around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that in the way that he decides to become an undercover cop and infiltrate, you know, the Black Panther gang. Mm -hmm. And the movie just takes you kind of on this journey of internal struggle and what it really means of the concept can people change? Oh. And uh, doing you know, what's supposed to be right versus uh -huh. what you truly believe in. And, and, uh, and uh, the people in it, they were, they were good. Um, 
No, no I, I don't want to get into it. What did you think of Judas and the Black Messiah? No, it's a good movie. It's a, it's a good movie. What, what do you think? I think that it was a really good movie. Yeah? What did you think? I thought, um, well, I liked the stars. I think the stars were good. You mean the actors? Yes, the act, the actors and the, the see that, that that's something that I like is that um, not only were they actors, they were also stars. Because I see those faces and I'm like, I recognize some of them. I think that that's that's what I like. I, I don't like it when when movies don't have people I know in them. What do you what do you think of that? I think on the contrary. I, I think oh. think you know movies that have less notable actors mm -hmm. bring up a more intriguing story. Mm. Because I feel like when you have a lot of big time actors, and this is kind of something that is seen in Devil all the time, is that mm. there seems to be a disconnect from what the true story is and the actors. Because there's kind of an ego to a lot of these actor actors in the industry. Um, and you see them for so many roles. So you can kind of get like typecasted. Mm -hmm. Star Wars, for example. Yeah. All those actors were very like unnotable uh, actors, they, they came from essentially nowhere. Harrison Ford was a carpenter, mm -hmm. you know? He worked on some small projects uh, beforehand. Uh-huh. Um, you okay? Um, I've just gotta keep moving. Um, let's, uh, why don't we get to the ratings? Um, how many miles per hour would you give uh, Judas and the Black Messiah? What? It's like speed, like how, 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 how fast? How, I mean, I... How fast? Well, this is a movie that you really want to, you know, kind of like, like dissect piece by piece. Oh, okay. And I, I, I feel like, you know, you, you don't want to go too fast into reading this movie. You really want to understand why these characters are the way that they are. Just give me your rate. Uh, how, fa how fast would you give Judas and the Black Messiah? Um, I, I would say about, you know, like, like five miles per hour. Oh, wow, that's really slow. That's like, I could run faster than that, I think. Are you sure? I would give it. Uh, I don't think 50... you realize how like fast five miles per hour is. Yeah, but when we're talking yeah. movie terms, you're not Usain Bolt. I'd give the movie fifty-five miles per hour because it's a fast movie, and um, because because there's violence in it, I wouldn't be wearing my seatbelt. Because I think, and you know what, you you press that button that turns off the airbags because. Um, it's it's a roller coaster, people. Um, it's a great film, and I love it. And it's um, it's ju uh, um, uh, Thank you so much for watching, Judas. Um, thanks for watching CK and CK at the movies. I'm your host, Cameron Kircher, and this is my guest, Cole Kajajian. And I'm your I hope host, you Cole Kajajian. Have a good night, Plattsburgh. Thank you. I'm your host, uh, Cameron Kircher. Um, I, I have a TV video production major. Um, and I, al I also brought an, another friend with me and his name is uh, Cole Kajajian. Uh, he has a psychology mate. Uh, no, camera's ready. Hi. Coming from the same award show that did this to actor Daniel K. Lua. K. Kaluuya. Kaluuya. Kaluuya, hallelujah, Kaluuya. Kaluuya, hallelujah, Kaluuya. Isn't that the movie about the guy who uh, killed Jesus Christ? Okay, we don't need those kinds of jokes here. No, I'm- You're wearing the cross, so. Yeah, exactly, so I'm, I'm incredible. Um, isn't Judas the guy who uh, like crucified Jesus Christ? No, he wasn't allowed to crucify him. Wearing the facts. Um, it's a it's a good movie and um, it has it has political, it has politics which I think is cool. Um, Wait, Sudeikis, right? Sudeikis. Sudeikis. Sedated. I want to be sedated. Sudeikis. Okay. I want to be Sudeikis. Okay. There you go. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna have that in my head totally. That's what I'm gonna think about. All right. I would give it like two candy bars. Mm. Okay. So. So it's a, there's a, there's almost a sweetness to it. That's cool. Yeah. I'd say if this movie was driving on like um, like a back road, like where you come from, um, Excuse where the speed me? limit is around uh, 30. I'd say it goes 50 because um, it kind of um, it doesn't doesn't follow the rules, which I I think is pretty impressive. Yeah.